This week on The Futurists, Ben Gertzel. You could say that the primary use cases for AI in the planet today are selling, killing, spying, and crooked gambling, aka Wall Street, which is <laughs> perhaps not what you really want the first generation of transhuman intelligence to ha have on its mind. Hi, welcome back to The Futurists. I'm Rob Tursik with my co-host, Brett, Brett King. King. I'm here too. Great to see you, Brett. And this week we've got a great guest. This is going to be ben fun. Ben Gertzel from Singularity Net. Ben has been at the forefront of research into artificial intelligence for many years. And an old acquaintance, both of ours. Great to have you back, Ben. Ben's yeah, not that old. Here. Great to be here. Hey. <laughs> Good to have you, man. Um, before we jump into that, there's a couple news items. So if you like, I can just do yeah, jump in, man. the news from the future. Really two things. Uh, as a follow-up to last week's uh, recording, we talked a little bit about the China and some of the changes that are happening there. Um, but the stock market has been uh, frowning upon recent moves in China to consolidate power around President Xi. And as a result, the Chinese tech stocks have collapsed. Uh, they're, they're down significantly. The uh, NASDAQ Dragon China Index has dropped by 20% uh, since those announcements from the uh, Chinese Communist Party Congress that happened just recently. Alibaba is down 32% uh, below its September wow. IPO. 1914, uh, sorry, 2014 IPO. And the Chinese currency, the renminbi, has dropped to its lowest level since 2007. So it looks like China is getting uh, seriously slammed uh, for the consolidation of power. That's how the markets seem to be responding. Uh, Good time one. to buy RMB. If you're interested. It's uh, The other news is that the United States is looking pessimistic about the future. There's news today from Gallup, uh, the research agency, and they report that 42%, just 42% of Americans, of American adults, think that it's either very or somewhat likely that today's youth will have a better living standard, better homes, and a better education than the previous generation. Now, that's always been kind of framed as the American dream, but it looks like that dream is soured. This is uh, an 18 percentage point drop since 2019. It's almost 20% drop in optimism. Um, and it's tied with the previous low, which was in 2011. Uh, one of the things that's driving that, interestingly, is uh, is two things. Wealthier people, people with higher income, around $100,000, are way more pessimistic than people with lower incomes, uh, which I don't know what that's meant to tell you. And then the other thing is that it's also a very strongly politically partisan uh, view on the future. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is to say that Republicans are way more pessimistic than than Democrats. Um, and the Democrats' uh, perspective on the future hasn't changed that much, but there's been a gigantic swing. Um, when Donald Trump was elected president in 2016, Republican optimism swung up 29%. And then when Joe Biden was elected last year, it fell 33 points. So you see like a 30% swing in optimism. And that's one of the things that's driven yeah, this crazy. Uh, too low since 2011. So there's the news, uh, markets reacting. Yeah, I negative. just got one, one item I'll add to that. Um, you know, um, Department of Education is tracking homelessness for students. Prior to the pandemic, 2018, 2019 school year, it was about 38,000 um, students were homeless across America. That's ballooned to 1.3 million last year and could exceed 2 million this year. Um, so we're looking at a, um, you know, a national increase in homelessness of like five, six hundred percent because of the it's pandemic and evictions. Major, wonder, major issue. Free market can't fix this. I it wonder if people are going to look back at this and and say like, was, remember that time in American history when we thought it was okay to step over someone who was living on the sidewalk? It seems pretty common in big American cities. We can't afford yeah. to have homeless people. It costs like thirty five thousand dollars a year. To, anyway, that's and that's for a future episode. Ben, right. welcome, welcome back, or welcome to the show. Um, the you know the obvious thing to start with is is um you know how are you and how your your you've had a couple of kids since um you know a couple of children since we last came on the show how are they going uh i'm 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 all good i've been having a, having a great time uh, these last last few years and i you know i was living in hong kong for 10 years right exactly and i i moved back to the us in early 2020 at the, at the start of the of the pandemic mostly not because of the political changes in hong kong which were 
not having an impact on, on everyday life there for me so much, but because it looked like they were going to impose more draconian yeah. COVID restrictions. And yeah. I felt, I felt, like, I, I felt like dealing with. So, yeah, I've been living on a small rural island in the Puget Sound off the coast of, of Seattle. So hang, hang, hanging out in the woods and, and on the beach with my family getting a lot of uh, AI development and uh, blockchain research done. And it's been, it's been a productive time. This fall, I've been starting to do business travel again because conferences have been opening up. Right, and right. Yeah, I actually yeah. had mixed feelings about it because I was being very productive, sitting home at the computer. Uh, I can getting, understand getting, that. Getting, getting stuff done, right? And it's, uh, so it's, been, it's been an interesting time. Yeah, I did uh, had uh, my fifth child uh during the during wow. the pandemic she's a year and a half year and a half old now and uh it's been so productive productive in a number of, of accounts and i, I would <laughs> say the pandemic and associated mayhem probably had less impact on what i've been doing in ai than on many parts of the economy because i mean we're Singularity Net, OpenCog, the various projects I'm involved in, we're, we're a bunch of AI geeks and programmers already mostly working from home from various locations all, all over the world, already coordinating by on, online mechanisms. And for the people who aren't familiar with your work, can you tell us about OpenCog and Singularity Net? Like, what are those yeah, two? Yeah, are? absolutely. So my, my own... My own career since the 1980s has been centrally focused on... AI, and in particular on AGI, artificial general intelligence. So trying to make thinking machines that can really think like people. Now that that's the long term, long term research project, which is getting closer and closer as, as we'll as we'll talk about. But along the way, I've been working on application of AI in a variety of different you know vertical areas, both because. One wants to have one's code doing useful things, not, not not just playing the research lab. And also, I mean, this is has helped for making money to pay to pay programmers and get real data into AI systems and so forth. So, OpenCog is an open source project aimed at laying the foundations for real artificial general intelligence for thinking machines that can think, learn, imagine, generalize like people. First version of OpenCog system was launched in two thousand eight. We're now working on an almost from the ground rewrite called OpenCog Hyperom, which is aimed to let OpenCog really scale up in a way that takes advantage of modern computing infrastructure. Then Singularity Net, a project I founded in 2017, is a blockchain based platform that allows AIs of any kind to run decentralized and a whole bunch of computers owned by a whole bunch of different people without any central owner or central controller. So you can you can run an open cog on that, you could run neural nets on that, you can run a lot a lot of different a lot of different different things on, on there. So I've been I've been sort of working at multiple levels in, in building an, an AI oriented tech stack and then also working on applications of these AI tools in a variety of areas, including longevity, medicine, crypto finance, r robotics. We got the Sophia robot and her of two course. little sisters. Yeah. Her little sisters, Grace and Grace and uh, and Desdemona. And that that piece has been more annoyingly influenced by the pandemic, just because you got hardware instead of just software. You got to get parts and pieces and so forth. Ben, Very interesting about AI. So you you are. Um... With Singularity Net, you're focused on using the blockchain to decentralize AI. That sounds really interesting and promising. Tell me why that's important. Um, you know, is there another group that's centralizing? Is AI tend to tend to be centralized, and is that important to differentiate from that? I mean, at at the moment, AI is very heavily centralized in its practical deployment, and it's it's centralized within a small number of large companies and, and and a few a few large large governments right and that's had good and bad aspects there's a certain efficiency of course that 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 comes with that i i, I think there's also then a tendency for ai to be channeled according to the the business models of these large large companies true, and true, the, true. the interests of these governments and I think 
that does have bad aspects as well as good. I mean, the, the good aspect is, you know, Google, Tencent, Facebook, Microsoft, Baidu are pretty efficient organizations at, at moving technologies from research to deployment, right? So they're, 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 good, they're good at doing stuff and they're making some amazing things happen. On the other hand, you could say that the primary use cases for AI on the planet today are selling, killing, spying, and 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 crooked gambling, aka Wall Street, which is perhaps True. perhaps not what you really want the first generation of transhuman intelligence to ha have on its mind as as it moves moves beyond the beyond the human level, right? And so I, I definitely want to get into the transhuman intelligence idea. That's that's something as well. But um, so let let me just um, sort of take us back to Singularity Net and 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 then talk about the developments in the last few years because last time we spoke was was pre pandemic and you know at that time you know you were doing a lot of work at, at Singularity Net to try and build these um, various components of artificial intelligence or competencies with a view that at some point we would be able to aggregate this up into AGI. Yeah. But the last few years, because of of the advances in deep learning, you know, these general purpose AIs that could lead us to AGI seem to be getting a lot of traction. So how has the overall thesis behind, um, you know, AGI changed over the last few years? So my, my own overall thesis regarding AGI and my own thinking about how to get to AGI has changed rather little in the last few years. And the ways in which it's changed are pretty in-depth in and mathematical and unrelated to the advances that that, that you mentioned. I mean, I, I posted a paper online called the, the General Theory of General Intelligence, which outlines some of the work I've been doing trying to unify different cognitive algorithms in, in, this, in a, standard, a standard math framework. So my, my thinking about how to get to machines that can really think hasn't changed too much. I mean, one thing that's changed over the last few years is that very large neural net models trained on huge amounts of data have done more and more cool things, right? right, and, right. and this is exciting. It's bringing money and attention to the AI world and it's doing useful stuff. What's the relation of this work to the quest to build real thinking machines is a different question. And so my friend, Gary Marcus, who would be a great guy for your podcast if you haven't had him yet. But so Gary Marcus, if you look at his online articles and videos, he's 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 made a pretty coherent, well thought out case that these recent advances in deep learning using large neural models constitute extremely little progress toward real general intelligence because pretty much they don't understand. What the hell is going on? I, right, I mean, right. I mean, I mean, they're, they're 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 faking it. They're faking it in a very interesting way because they have so much data to use to to drive their faking it. And in some domains, that will work pretty well. So, like, if if you look at generating art or something, yeah, yeah, I was just gonna true. say that. Yeah. I mean, these programs, are ne they're never going to be Van Gogh. They're never going to be Andy Warhol. They're not going to come up with some new thing that hadn't ever been done before because what they're doing is looking at surface level patterns and compositing them together in, 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 in exactly. ways. On the other hand, that's kind of what many commercial graphic artists or even some... Yeah. Well-known fine artists are, are, are doing right. Like you can, you can, you can, you can, you can get some mileage that way. So, part of the discovery here is like how much of what humans do, which we consider impressive and, and, and lucrative and intelligent, how much of it can be just faked by gathering a bunch of stuff and glom glomering it together in this sort of a sort of artful way. So that. That's so you're interesting. Saying that synthetic imagery and sy synthetic art is kind of a parlor trick. Uh, it's like a neural net parlor trick. Well, it's that's that's unfair to it because parlor tricks don't solve real world problems and they 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 they, they don't make huge, huge amounts of money. So I, I think it's it's a new category of of entity, right? So it's it's more than a parlor trick and and less than 
less than an, an, an AGI, right? Because okay. let, let's say in, in, in the but domain... But there's, no, there's no path there towards uh, general intelligence I, in other I, words. I, I, those, I don't those. think so. Like So in the, in the domain of music, which I've been playing a bunch with generative yeah. models in music, because I one of the things I've done the last few years is started playing the keyboard again. We started a rock band with a robot as as, as a lead vocalist. So we, we've we been playing with AI for generating singing and, 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 and generating music. And I mean, it's it's genuinely cool as a musician, right? Like the AI will come up with new melodies or new vocal stylings that inspires me as a musician to play different things that, that, than I would otherwise, right? So, I mean, it's 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 all good. It's not just a cheap demo. On, on the other hand, like no way does it come at music with the passion and inventiveness of a, of, you know, a really outstanding original human musician or composer or, or improvisers or something. Right. So it's, uh, it's okay, but back to Brett's question. You, you know, Brett was asking whether you see a point where these different strands of technology will, will be integrated or Converge. aggregated. Yeah. And then somehow I, maybe AGI I, is emerging from that. Is that, is I that do the think there's a path to AGI in which multiple components architected according to different architectures cooperate together and you get some emergent, intelligence out of it but i think among those components needs to be something with some fundamental capability for abstraction generalization creativity and and, and imagination and i think that the we current, that front? The current that... Neural nets don't 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 really have this so you, you can't yeah. i don't think you can just take a bunch of narrow ais serving some vertical application functions network those together in singularity net or anything else and general intelligence pops out like you, you, you right you right, right. There, like so you need to... to take a new neuron first approach is that what you suggest no i think there's a number there are many approaches that one could take i mean the, the approach we're taking in open cog actually is you have components that are doing symbolic logical reasoning you have components that are simulating evolution for creativity and 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 are, are doing doing evolutionary learning and you have components that, that are doing neural net pattern recognition and you can you can network network all of these together but i think i think while that's the approach that we're taking which is using some advanced math to structure a, a variety of, of different algorithms i think you could also take a more biological approach and try to do you know deep dive neural and glial and astrocyte modeling and to try to take the biology biology more seriously than than current neural nets are doing i think there's there's a variety of approaches that could be taken to to general intelligence but i don't think the current deep neural nets that are sort of fine-tuned to meet narrow application goals based on training on large data sets the, these alone these alone cannot do it actually where but I massive data sets are, are going to be critical, right? I don't know. I mean, the smarter your AI is, the smaller a data set you can get away with. I mean, part of the reason you need such huge data sets is because there's no generalization happening. So you, right, you need right. sizable data sets. But I mean, you know, mid-journey has seen more images that, that, than I have, and GPT-3 has seen more language that, that, than I have. That that amount of That amount of data isn't really isn't really necessary so i i do anyway i do think you can get multiple components cooperating together to sort of emerge emerge in agi but you okay need... but when people hear the word emergent i know what some of the people listening are going to say some of the people that are listening are going to say hang on a second you're saying if you aggregate all these different technologies and different approaches and combine them together then something magic will happen that's what emergence is something magic occurs and now suddenly we have intelligence and they're like that's well, not i going don't think i don't think it's magic i mean when you put hydrogen and oxygen together to get water i mean the water is wet the hydrogen and oxygen were not wet but that's not magic it's just yeah it's but just we're not chemistry. combining molecules it's, it's, here it's right chemistry right i mean and the yeah, same the same is... thing in the brain i mean if you put we're putting the hippocampus and the cortex together and they do stuff that neither hippocampus nor cortex does on their own. But the, the, okay, I mean, so that, you're saying that science, replicate that's not magic, brain functions. It's, it's emergence. Yeah. Oh, okay, so what I'm hearing you say is that if you can replicate certain brain functions and algorithms uh, and combine those together, then we might have the generalization that you're referring to. That, or, or, or am I missing something? You talked about an abstraction layer. I'm trying to figure out where and when that gets developed and introduced. Well, I think there are going to be many different 
approaches to building general intelligence. I'm, I'm not sure there's only one only one golden path. And I I, I I I do think there are paths that are more closely tied to human biology, and there are paths that are less closely tied to human biology. So I think one can look at human cognition and the different kinds of learning and memory that human cognition deals with declarative memory, episodic Very memory, true. sensory memory, you know, a- action, attention. You can look at the cognitive functions that the human mind carries out and figure out, you know, clever mathematical algorithms to do each of these cognitive functions, maybe in a quite different way than, than, than the human brain does, then have a network that combines together different agents performing mathematical algorithms corresponding to different key cognitive functions in, in the human mind. And there could be, you don't need a neuron in there. You, you don't necessarily need any, any simulation of anything in the brain. On the other hand, I think you could also simulate the nonlinear dynamics of neurons and glia and, and chemical and electrical diffusion for the brain, maybe even the quantum dynamics and the water mega molecules in the brain. Like you could, you could, you could, you could go all out and do a detailed biological model and you you could then get a generalization and and creativity and imagination from from that route. So I think there's going to be many paths to general intelligence, which could lead to different kinds of of intelligence. Different flavors it, of yeah. It, it, it just happens that deep neural nets, as they exist right now for commercial applications, I don't I don't think I don't think those are one of the many paths to general intelligence. Interesting. That that, that, that can work. All right. That's well, funny. that's a good place for us to take a little bit of a break here. We're going to have a break. But just before we jump to that, Brett wants to ask you the quick fire questions. So take it away, my friend. OK, here's the quick fire lightning round. Ben, what was the first science fiction you remember being exposed to? Star Trek, the original Star Trek TV show. Very cool. Um, what name a futurist or an entrepreneur or scientist that has influenced your thinking and why? Uh, Gerald Feinberg, The Prometheus Project, he wrote a book outlining the singularity in 1968, which I read in 73 or so, which kind of kind of blew my mind. He outlined nanotechnology, AGI and immortality and said we had to decide whether to use them for stupid commercialism or expanding human consciousness. So I read that at like age seven and I was like, it's a pretty, this, this uh, pretty good point. Talking about, yeah, right? yeah. Um, this is a maybe a tougher question. What's the best prediction an entrepreneur, futurist, or sci-fi author has ever made? Do you think oh, the the best prediction ever made? Well, I mean, Cyrano de Bergerac said we'd go to the moon. That was a pretty good one made yeah. eight hundred of years ago. And in in the modern era, actually, my my buddy Ray Kurzweil has not done badly. I mean, his he has his track record is not. Quite as good as he as he is as he markets, times, but it, but it's it's pre- pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it's still pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. 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 Um, and then uh, finally, just before break, what science fiction story do you think is most representative of the future you hope for? Oh, of the future, I I, I hope I hope for. Well, I I I don't know that I have a I have a good answer for that one actually. Okay, that's but cool. That that, that, that one that one. Uh, May may have may have yet to be written. So. All right, good. Well, um, that's uh, that's the first segment done. We're just going to take a quick break and have some words from our sponsors, and we'll be back to talk about how living with alternative intelligences and AIs AI is going to change the future of humanity after the break. Provoke Media is proud to sponsor, produce, and support the Futurist Podcast. Provoke.fm is a global podcast network and content creation company with the world's leading fintech podcast and radio show, Breaking Banks. And of course, it's spin-off podcasts, Breaking Banks Europe, Breaking Banks Asia Pacific, and the Fintech Five. But we also produce the official Finnovate podcast, Tech on Reg, Emerge Everywhere, the podcast of the Financial Health Network, and Next Gen Banker. For information about all our podcasts, go to Provoke.fm, Or check out Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. Welcome back to The Futurists with myself, Brett King, and Rob Tersek as co-host. And we have uh, Ben Goetzel live from um, the 
the coast of Seattle. Where did you say it was that you're living these days, Ben? I'm actually on Vashon Island, which is uh, in the Puget Sound. Off the okay, coast Puget of Sound, beautiful uh, area of uh, of the country. Um, but uh, Ben spent um, an extensive period in Hong Kong, um, working in southern China, and so um, that is sort of the subject for news from the future deep dive today. Let's get to it. Uh, so um, there's been a lot of debate um, in the U.S. press over the, the last uh, a few news cycles of the progress being made in artificial intelligence in um, China. Um, that is a big driver towards the recent, uh, you know, which we spoke about in the last deep, deep dive in terms of uh, chipset controls and things like that uh, for export and import um, that the U.S. has put on China. But Nick Chalan, uh, the U.S. Department of State's first first ever software chief, was forced to resign in September 2021 after he claimed that the United States had no competing fighting chance against China in the next 15 to 20 years based on artificial intelligence. And in the National Defense uh, Report uh, from September of this year, so very recent, um, the, United, uh, the Special Competitive Studies Project released a new study called Mid-Decade challenges to national competitiveness, identified that China is continuing to invest and has surpassed the US in three key areas, semiconductor development, artificial intelligence, and 5G. And this was from uh, the CEO of the Defense Writers Group, saying that the US has just one budget cycle to get this right, uh, Bajra Qatari. Um, Yili Bajkatari said, if we don't get our act together in these three core battlegrounds in terms of bio, in terms of next generation computing power, in terms of next generation inventions, it's not going to happen in the countries that are the forefront of dem democracies today. Everything will happen in China. Now, we tried to stop them on 5G, but the US, uh, you know, clearly is significantly behind on 5G. We're significantly significantly behind on edge computing. And in terms of artificial intelligence development, um, the latest statistics show that China produces somewhere between, and it depend, you know, it depends on the stats that you read, three PhD to five or eight PhD graduates in the fields of artificial intelligence for every one that the US produces. So they're just able to um, throw a lot more bodies at this problem. Eric Schmidt has been one of the real voices of concern in terms of AI development. He says, the real issue is compression of time. These systems are going to have to make decisions faster than human decision-making timeframes, and that's where the boundary is going to be, and we're going to have a serious conversation about that in society. So these short term concerns, um, you can see playing out. The major voice in terms of the AI threat to the United States market has not been from the market itself, but from US Defense Department, um, which sees this as a big strategic threat. So how is the US going to compete? Well, my call on this is stopping China from developing these technologies. We tried that with 5G and we failed. Huawei is dominant in terms of 5G standards and technologies right now globally. The only way for us to compete in the United States is by making AI-based and STEM-based education across the board free, because that's the core infrastructure that you need to develop competitiveness of these skills. And while we continue to have this pay for play, you know, um, free market approach to education, we are restricting the lifeblood force of AI development in uh, in China. We have the investment, we just don't have the skills. That's my deep dive for this week. Ben, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Sure. So I, I, I did, I lived in Hong Kong for 10 years and I had many dozens of visits in, in, into mainland to meet people in various universities and and, and companies in in china doing doing all, all, all sorts of different work i mean i i think that you know that the push of china into the ai field has been substantial and impressive but still has serious limitations i, I would say the vast majority 
of significant AI innovations have come from the US up until today still. And with Western Europe following second and China way, way behind in terms of really like wild new ideas coming out. China probably behind Russia or Japan for that matter, if, if, if you want but to then, count. Then so we I, hear well, all about what we China, China has, China what China has excelled at is scalable deployment of, of, of AI, AI, right? So right. the algorithms, the ideas have mostly come from US and Western European universities and PhD students, not even from Western companies. But then the typical pipeline has been professors and PhD students come up with new stuff, they prototype it. Western companies roll it out first, proving it can be done commercially. Then Chinese companies take it and roll it out better at larger scale and sort of mas master the, the real world deployment, right? And so that that's that's the story as we've seen it so far. And then when when ethnic Chinese researchers emigrate to the West and embed themselves in Western companies and universities, then you often see the innovation level of what they produce go way up because the the social the social context is just is just different. Like China hasn't managed to make a Google DeepMind or or an open AI or say an, an open cog or or, 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 sing, or singularity net, right? But they which is cooking up like wild new frontier ideas. But mm -hmm. deployment is also important, and they they've certainly shown incredible mastery there. Now, so there, there's been this flood of, of research papers. Uh, you know, Brett pointed out this week, and we spoke about it with a previous guest as well. Uh, some people say there's an exponential increase, as they always do, about anything that goes up and to the right. An exponential increase in the number of uh, AI research papers being produced by Chinese researchers. My question for and you is, what's the problem here? Uh, there's a, yeah, there's a large number of, uh, of filings, but patent filings as well as papers. Um, but there's a difference between quantity and quality. So Ben, what's your perception on the quality of the research that's being done in China? Is that significantly better just because they're throwing more people at the problem? I think quality also has to be drilled down into a, a, a little bit. I mean, I, I, I think... There's a lot of very high quality research coming out of China and also some, some lower quality research. I think that on the whole, the Chinese system is even more biased than the Western system toward research, which is improving incrementally on previously published stuff according to easily quantified metrics, like getting a couple percent higher accuracy on this benchmark for, for, uh, you know, Im 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 image recognition or, or, or language understanding or something. And what you're still not seeing coming out of China is the next radical new innovation that, that, that nobody ever thought of. I mean, you, you're seeing a lot of papers that do one after the other, after the other, after the other incremental improvements on, on already published results in some well-defined area. And that's that's not to say that's bad quality. It can be great great quality work, but I, I would say the Chinese system has not yet solved the problem of incubating radical innovation. Now, they they may not need to do that in order to conquer and prevail from an economic or, or even a, a military standpoint for, for, for that matter. Right, right. But it's still, it's, it's still a point to understand, right? Like that, that. So one of the things you're pointing out, there's a distinction between basic science, like, you know, basic scientific research and applied science. Um, and, and in the case of applications, it, it looks like the Chinese are actually moving ahead a, very quick. A good example of that is Chinese mobile wallets, actually. And the approach that players like Alipay or Ant Group have taken to aggregating wallet capabilities, you know, I'd be very surprised if most of the world isn't using Chinese mobile wallets by 2030 because of their approach to this, which, you know, is, it, it, you know, for MasterCard and Visa, that's got to be a huge threat. But that's a, a different angle. Unless, unless they're using crypto wallets, which were developed True. outside True. of China due to China banning. Right. 
banning crypto because of their their need to control of course crypto. well the cbdc because they yeah. see that crypto yeah, as a competitor right. against, against that but so ben i, I want to dive a little bit into um this concept you know you, you've been involved in humanity plus and, and other areas of the transhumanist movement for for many years um so you know we had zoltan istifan on a few weeks ago yeah. uh, talking talking yeah. about um that movement but uh, just let me ask you this question is how do you think we're going to absorb um you know first of all alternative intelligences into our sort of worldscape uh, you know um as as humanity and uh, you know how are we going to respond to you know superhuman intelligence over time you know how is that going to change the way we view intelligence itself do you think the the uh, emergence of AGI I think our view of intelligence right now is is very primitive and and crude very and narrow. it is overfitted to ourselves right so I, I mean I mean and there's then a very broad mathematical theory of of general intelligence as put out by say Marcus Hooter in his book Universal AI but that's that's not closely connected to our theory of intelligence in in psychology with I, I, IQ tests and whatnot. So certainly, having a variety of different generally intelligent minds to study and build and interact with and think about. I mean, the, this will give us a greatly expanded model of intelligence, and indeed, it may lead us to new concepts besides intelligence i mean we may decide that intelligence is not 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 the most interesting quantity to be thinking about anyway i mean there there's a bit of a parallel in biology where like w- w- what is life has never been pinned down precisely and yes, with synthetic that's... biology you're screwing around with with constructs that are at the border between life and non-life but in the end like how living is this is not such an interesting question to ask if you're if you're a, if you're a synthetic biologist, you're interested in like what 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 can the system do? What properties do, do, does it have? Right? And I, I, I mean, the, I, I, I think a, pro- lot the, a lot of Let these are going to be about this, Brett. they're going to be legacy done. concepts, right? Right. So, so one of the things you mentioned earlier in the show is uh, is revisiting some of the biological thinking about um, intelligence. And and as it turns out, there is a, a, an alien intelligence here on the planet Earth that just happens to be underwater. I'm talking about octopuses. Um, have, have have robotics and AI researchers learned anything from other biological forms of intelligence? Is that in any way an inspiration? Um, I, I would be very curious to hear about your thoughts on octopus intelligence. Interesting. When you said there was a non-human form of intelligence on the planet, I thought I thought you were referring to multinational corporations. So, so you could, I mean, yeah. I mean, the you hive could, mind. Yeah. yeah, you, you could. I I I think that. Non-human intelligences have certainly served as conceptual inspiration to AI researchers, just in terms of showing you that there are other ways to do things. So we don't need to be slavishly tied to the precise human architecture, right? Like you can look at dolphin language. It seems that somehow dolphins can transmit to each other details about the 3D you know, mm-hmm. architecture of, of the bottom of the ocean and, and flows of water. So maybe they're like sending map information in continuous variable transmissions or something. And that, that makes you think, well, you know, when two AIs communicate with each other, it doesn't have to be by discrete symbols arranged in, in a sequence like, like human Text sentences. messages. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm with so you. Something like, a, like an octopus appears to have a less centralized mode of intelligence yeah, than, than a human being where the, the different tentacles, the tentacles have their own autonomous limited autonomy the way they yeah. coordinate has a bit more of a flavor of you know complex self-organization nonlinear dynamical emergence and 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 blah 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 which which can be can be how people on a soccer team coordinate uh, actually m- more so than than how than how the parts of your 
your body tend to coordinate. So, it, and another example of non-human intelligence is the um, I, I'm trying to think of the name of it. It's the um, it's the mushroom or fungi uh, that extend through a forest. And yeah, the mycelial network. I mean, mycelial ba- ba- okay. bacteria. I mean, in, I remember in the 80s reading papers, or maybe early 90s papers on the uh, intelligence of bacterial colonies as well as they can they can do some re- re- reinforcement learning to figure yeah. out figure you out communicate what, what by secretion <laughs> yeah so there yeah. i would say at the high level the existence of this whole field and constellation of different kinds of intelligences that inspires one not to be too rigorously tied to exactly how human beings do it. I mean, I think it helps drive home the point that like humans, humans are one among a pretty broad class of possible intel- intelligent systems. Right on. Where, right on. And each of these different kinds of intelligent systems has different properties. So they're, yeah. they're not, it's, it's more different than apples and apples and oranges, right? And I mean, they evolve for different contexts, yeah. different ecosystems. Yeah, okay, let doing, me ask you another question. Different sorts of things and what finding a common measure of intelligence to compare these different systems is not necessarily interesting. But oh, going back to science fiction, if you, if you read the the Stanislaw Lem novel Solaris from I guess the sixties, I mean, I mean, I mean that 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 that's about an intelligent alien ocean that clearly has a superhuman level of complexity and intelligence in some sense, but it's just so weird and alien, people can't pin it down. And there, there's certainly a possibility that AGI that emerges on Earth will have that characteristic, like some that kind oceanic of... Oceanic quality. Some kind of intelligence will come about by a combination of engineering and emergence and its own unsupervised learning. Okay, let me be, ask you a related question. It will be a super smart mind fabric, but we won't be able to understand it as right. human we unless we be jack, it, yeah. jack our brains into it. And, that's, the, and that's the problem. Right? It, right? Let, let's talk about the hardware limitations and capabilities that exist. One of, one of the reasons that we've had see, we've seen such rapid increase in the application of machine learning in the last 10 years has been because the cost of computing has dropped. GPUs have gotten to be way more powerful yeah. and they continue to get more powerful. So, you know, the, the usual story you know, is like, well, we've got better algorithms, we've got much bigger data sets, and now we've got much more affordable compute power uh, with GPUs. Tell me about that as you project forward into the future. Like, how important oh, yeah. well, is the hardware factor? I mean, the next step there. So, my friend uh, Rachel St. Clair, who you should also interview, she's we should she's yeah, yeah, called uh, Simuli, Simuli.ai. And we're we're actually working together to make an, an AGI board that we hope can do for for AGI architectures what GPUs have done for deep deep neural nets. So, we got, ah, we got interesting, we got a bunch of. I designed this, a specialized chip for open code pattern matching. She designed a chip for what's called hypervector math, which underlies some kinds of neural net neural net implementation. So we're making a board. You put a GPU, a CPU, open open cog pattern matching chip, a hypervector chip with fast processor processor interconnect. So it seems like the way we're going is specialized chips corresponding to particular classes of AI algorithms. Wire that wire them tightly together on a single board, then just make huge huge racks of these in, in the server farm, and then then ultimately you scale them down and pack them in, into imbe- into embedded devices, and then so that that we're working on now, those should roll out in a few years. But then the next step after that, obviously, is quantum hardware, and then there's tremendous tremendous progress. I'm really interested. There. I mean, it seems like it. See, I mean, it's not going to happen as fast as as more advanced specialized AI silicon chips, classical ones. But I mean, 10 years from now, I really think we're going to have quite powerful forms of quantum AR hardware. Again, perhaps general purpose quantum Turing machines isn't going to be the main thing, but specialized quantum AI AI, AI, AI circuits carrying out particular particular functions, right? So, I mean, I, I think hardware will keep exploding exponentially along along with the software and enabling a greater and greater variety of AI algorithms to scale and up. How, and how does the blockchain fit into this, into your vision of uh, of AGI? Well, blockchain allows you to roll out massive scale deployed AI systems without a central owner or controller. 
And this, so it's a little bit like SETI AI, SETI uh, in a sense, SETI at home. If if yeah, uh, is that a fair I mean, comparison? If you look more broadly, the internet and the Linux operating system are two examples of decentralized networks without a central owner or controller, which have been highly, highly influential in part due to their decentralized nature, which has made it hard for them to be pulled into some particular organization's narrow goals. And we we want to see the network of deployed AI mind components be more like the internet or Linux than like, for example, mobile or or, or, or Windows, right? I think that that, that sort of openness has has a lot lot of different implications. Awesome. Value. Now, now, um, you know, you you talked about quantum AI. This is something that is really interesting. Um, you know, is this is this a hardware function, or is you know, it, it, or is the development of quantum AI more uh, about us learning to do things like deep learning on quantum computers? Because at the moment, right, right, right now, it's gated by hardware. We just don't have enough right. qubits. Or qubits on the machines. I mean, of course. There's more and more math to do, but the, the actually the math of quantum AI has really advanced tremendously in the in the last few years. So now there's way more awesome fleshed out quantum AI algorithms than we can run until we get a lot more qubits on the machines. Awesome. Well, um, at this point in the show, um, we like to wrap up with some sort of big sky thinking, you know, looking out far into the future before we wrap up. So let me let me ask you this, um, you know, over the next 30 to 50 years, um, you know, as you look forward uh, into humanity, um, what do you think are going to be the biggest changes that happen to humanity? And what are you most optimistic about for the future? I mean, the biggest change that will happen to humanity is the advent of artificial general intelligence with capability beyond the human level, which will do two things. It will do many things, actually. I mean, it will it will abolish material scarcity at the Absolutely. level of our everyday human needs. It will abolish death and, and disease, except for those who, who happen to, to desire them. And it will give humans the ability to transcend their ordinary human condition by merging themselves into some sort of distributed supermind. So the, the, these will be rather substantial changes to the Big human changes. condition, although, you know, Amish style, people who want to retain legacy humanity, I, I hope will still be able to. I think you know that that sort of speciation, that g gap between augmented humans and and natural humans, is is a given because some people will choose uh, choose not to to do that. But the the concept of these super intelligent AIs that can solve problems that we can't conceive solutions of is, of course, fascinating in terms of where it takes us. Um, you know, how do you, you know, do do you have any thoughts on what the motivations of AI might be in this world? You know, I think that motivation, like intelligence or life, is a legacy concept that will seem less interesting a, a, a few a few decades from now. I mean, human human beings, you know, each human intelligence evolved to control a particular body, and so we have very particular goals, like you know, the the four Fs from biology, right? Right, I mean, right, right. I mean, what we want to eat, we want to not. Want to get clobbered? Maybe what we want to reproduce, and and, and so forth, right? So, I, I I think an AI is going to be more heterogeneous than 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 that, and it's going to have a lot of lot of different sort of gradients along along with, along which it's it's evolving. If we can get some core human values like compassion, you know, joy choice growth and expansion if we can get some core human values codified yeah like in the and trained and and, and taught in, in, into the into the ai right that then then and these help to guide the ongoing evolution of of, of the ai the, the, then i think i think things will come out will come out quite well these are not necessarily the core values being put into large-scale yeah, commercial AI exactly. systems at present, so in that regard, it's probably fortunate that current large-scale commercial AI systems don't have that much potential to to evolve directly into general Amen. intelligences. 
Fantastic. Well, Ben, it's time for us to wrap up. I'm, you know, I got to respect your time. Um, I, I will just ask before we wrap up, how do people follow your thinking and the work you're doing at uh, OpenCog and Singularity? dot uh, net and um, a, the AGI Society. Yeah, check out my own website, uh, gertzel.org. Putting weird shit on the internet since 1995 or so. <laughs> and then, then uh, singularitynet.io, which is a more professional and structured website, which has links into work on o- OpenCog and the various other projects we've discussed. Fantastic. Well, Ben Gertzel, thank you for joining us on The Futurists. A fascinating conversation as always, and, and we wish you all the best. Thanks for having me. That's it for The Futurists this week. If you liked the show, and I'm sure you did, fascinating content, make sure to give us a shout out on social media, give us a five-star review on your podcasting platform of choice, and just generally share the uh, the crap out of the show so more people uh, get it. We are in the top 1% of podcasts globally now, so we're making phenomenal progress since our launch in April, but we can always do better. Um, our thanks to uh, Sylvie Johnson, Kevin Hershon, and Elizabeth Severins, and Carlo Navarro, who support the team at Provoke Media for on the production side. But that's it for the Futurists this week. We'll definitely see you next week with more good future-focused content. Until then, we'll see you in the future. Well, that's it for the Futurists this week. If you like the show, we sure hope you did. Please subscribe and share it with the people in your community. And don't forget to leave us a five-star review that really helps other people find the show. And you can ping us anytime on Instagram and Twitter at at Futurist Podcast for the folks that you'd like to see on the show or the questions that you'd like us to ask. Thanks for joining. And as always, we'll see you in the future.